Hello and welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. My name is Brianna and over there is Courtney. Hello. I love the way you say hello. Hello. You know Every that, time. <laughs> that's just it. People walk. Hello. Hello. Uh, this is this is just what I say. <laughs> so before we get started, we always remind you that there's a few things. And now a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to GEICO. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance. In our description and show notes, you know the deal. There's going to be links to our social media if you want to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Also links to some resources for uh, mental health and stuff like that. If you wanted to look into those, it's easy for you. And some links to the resources that we use to research every story. So if you want to follow up and do more reading, you can always check out our show notes and follow the links. And then the last thing in there is some links to our Threadless and our Patreon. And again, on Threadless, we have like t-shirts and sweaters and phone cases, big stuff like that. And on Patreon, we've got bonus episodes and some small items like stickers and magnets and stuff. So yeah, check those out if you wanted to uh, be on our Threadless and get some merch or get some stuff through Patreon. So we have a few new patrons on Patreon this week. So we wanted to say thank you to Brenda, Dan, and Ashley. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, you guys. And Brenda is one of my favorite people on Facebook because she's got this tiny little puppy that's called Otter Pop. And it's a little Yorkie. I'm oh, obsessed with I it. I saw a picture. You of did? It. I saw a little otter pop today. Oh, my God. That's a real dog. Yeah. I'm obsessed with that dog. Oh, I thought it was just somebody like, oh, here's my cute nope. picture. Oh, it's real? No, Brenda knows. I'm like, How yeah, soon can if, Brenda get here with right? otter pop? <laughs> we need you. Oh, my God. <laughs> The best like partner with true crime is like you're super sad and then you've got a little puppy to cheer you up. You know what I mean? That's what I look to my dog for. (laughs) I thought it was a fake picture. No, it's so real. So thanks again to Brenda, Dan and Ashley. And we love your puppy pictures, Brenda. So with all that said, we are still on letter C this week and we're talking about cannibals. So this story is a little bit more typical to cannibalism. The last couple ones we did, like Big Lurch is a drug-fueled one, so that's kind of an outlier. And then we've got Leonardo from last week, and that one's more ritualistic, kind of witchcraft stuff. Yeah. So it's a little different. Like true murderous cannibalism is cannibalism for cannibalism's sake, right? So this story is a little bit more in line with that. I agree. But since we haven't had like a typical, I can't say typical cannibal. I'm laughing but- <laughs> at this whole thing right now. How we're like typical cannibal to the not typical cannibal. But what we, but think I get of, what you're saying. Yeah, completely. Like, what we think of as a, you know a cannibal murder motivated by eating a person. We're gonna like talk about that tonight. So I looked into a little bit of cannibal history because that's kind of something I'm just interested in. Like I I wanted to know. It you is know? interesting because I don't know about you. But I've never been like curious about eating a person, right. trying never something, crossed tasting my mind. an eyeball, taking a bite out of a toe. It's never crossed my mind. So yeah, where does that come from? Right. It's got to be primitive brain, caveman mm-hmm. brain kind of stuff. And that's kind of what I was finding in my little small research that I did. So like cannibalism has existed all throughout human history. Every culture at one point or another practiced cannibalism. So even though it's something that's super taboo, it's very prevalent throughout ancient times. It's historically been a method to deal with overpopulation or a means of survival during famine or even a way to process grief. The processing grief is an interesting way to handle that. Right. 
It's very interesting. It was seen uh, like kind of as a sign of respect almost yeah. or, you know, some sort of adoration or love for the person that passed away. And especially the more prominent or higher of, of influence in the society, the more probability they were going to eat them, it seems, because – you know, if they were a king or, a, you know, like get a slice laughing. of dog, he was a really <laughs> successful investment banker. We respected him. He was very well respected. He made the most money. We got to eat Doug. We need that know? energy. Even yeah. though he's a dead body, it's like the energy's gone. But I mean, you know, I, I can go with this. But it seems like at that time, people had exactly. more of an ability to detach from the fact that this was a human. Okay. Thank you for and saying that. And especially the scarcity of food in some cultures and you Absolutely. Know. No, the the famine part of it, I completely yeah, get. Yeah, Donner that Party makes, and whatnot. Donner Party's just been going through my head this whole time. And I kind of started laughing because I'm thinking Donner Party is not only famine, it is also processing grief in a way. Right? Yeah. But, but it's so bleak they just had so to. So bleak. Yeah. So in 2003, there was a publication that received a lot of press attention when it suggested that early humans had practiced extensive cannibalism, that it was way more prevalent than we had realized. I believe it. Yeah. I don't really find this difficult to believe, honestly. I'm not offended. Yeah. It's like, just, it doesn't offend me that they put out this journalism. I it's mean, history. Yeah. And if, you know, if you can prove it scientifically, like, it is what it is. It's yeah. just, Yeah. So according to this research, genetic markers commonly found in modern humans suggest that today many people have a gene that evolved as a protection against specific brain diseases that were spread by consuming human brain tissue. Human so body even is so amazing. Yeah, if you just look at this, you know, this study had come to the conclusion that if you look at current day biology, you can trace it back and see that we've developed some resistance to these cannibalistic diseases. Very interesting. Again, it just seems like even though it's very taboo currently, it's probably more widespread than we realize. So in most societies, cannibalism was not the social norm. But in the communities where it was, it fell into two categories. So consuming a person within your community is classified as endocannibalism, which would be when a person eats part of a recently deceased person to honor them, uh, kind of absorb their qualities and characteristics, or to help that person's soul transition to the afterlife. Do you think they have a big party? It seems like it's part of the funeral ritual in yeah. some ancient cultures. You a know? big send off. Right. If you're in the community, sure. And exocannibalism, the other category, involves consuming a person from outside your community and usually occurs after winning a battle with a rival. And in these communities, they're doing so with the belief that that act of cannibalism helps them to absorb their opponent's power and attributes and positive qualities. I could see that. I guess. Right? I mean... Or revenge or they're something, already dead. I feel like. Like, you win, but you've got to take it there, I guess. It's overkill, but... It is overkill. Again, it's like in a society where maybe cannibalism is a little bit more normalized, maybe it's not that far-fetched to think that yeah. you're absorbing their power. Although cannibalism was much more common in ancient times, as time went on, it became more rare. And people would often report cannibalism as a method to separate themselves as superior and more civilized. So it's highly possible that later reports of cannibalism were a little bit more inaccurate and possibly even just flat out racist or motivated by fear. You know? I can see that. Yeah. It's just, it seems like... It's more prevalent than we think. However, the more current the report is, the more it seems a little sketchy. Definitely. Accusations of cannibalism helped characterize indigenous people as uncivilized and primitive or even inhuman. It was just a means of separating, it seems, you know. But what we are talking about today are cannibals that exist beyond that cultural norm and commit murder for that specific purpose of eating their victims. Unlike other serial killers, cannibals are typically not sadistic, and they actually try to kill their victims pretty quickly to minimize suffering. 
which I really didn't realize before looking into it. I don't either. But now that you say it, it's kind of, you know, it's not about the life. It's about the death. Right. It so, really isn't about the murder itself. No. Their end goal is just the meal. Yeah. Ew. Yeah. You know, like Gross. really, it's, it's true. Super disgusting, but that's really <laughs> that's really their end goal. Yeah. You know? You're right. So cannibals are often more interested in the body itself and the act of devouring that person than actually killing them or causing harm or torture or anything like that. And we see this like with Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, trying to kind of turn them into zombies and make them not feel anything and then take them apart. Yeah, I feel like a lot of times you hear about cannibalism, it's related to some obsession with the body. Mm -hmm. It's very clinical. Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, he cut them in this and that and it was about the body itself. And then there's the other side of it where it's about concealing the evidence of what you've done. And... Typically, you know, a true cannibal to me is, I mean, they're just going to like be all about the blood and the guts and the ickiness of it all. That's what you would think. Yeah. They just kind of want to play around inside the body. It's gross. But it really did surprise me that that doesn't really extend to suffering. You know, they want that person to die quickly. Dr. Eric Hickey, professor of forensic psychology at Walden University, says, quote, Of the estimated 2,000 active serial killers in the United States, between 5 and 10 are probably cannibals as well. I don't believe that just a bite mark on a person qualifies as a cannibal either. you got to be eating a person to be one of these 5 to 10%. Absolutely. Dr. Hickey has developed a profile of cannibals and explains that they are almost never true psychopaths. Instead of having detachment issues and trouble connecting with people, they usually tend to be extremely clingy and needy, and they struggle with their self-esteem, which is interesting. It kind of separates them from other serial killers. They don't have that um, like bravado of, mm-hmm. I'm here to kill you. Right. I'm the devil, and I'm here to do the devil's business. That kind of, you know, behind it all, like, rah, rah. They're just, you know, oh, I work at the chocolate factory. <laughs> Right. I mean, that's the perfect. Oh, my God. Yeah. Dumber is the perfect example. Just a normal, quiet guy. Just. Yeah. Just looking for a relationship and love and someone to connect with. And yeah. Clean. Nine to five needy. at the chocolate factory. The act of eating a person is really more about relationships and intimacy than murder or causing harm to a person. Dr. Hickey says, quote, cannibals tend to feel insecure and can't have normal relationships eating their victims gives them a sense of power because their victims can never leave. If you're just a body, yeah. I mean, if you can't have a normal relationship, if you can't even hold a conversation with someone, but then you've got this 14-year-old boy that you've killed, you've got his body just sitting up in a chair, yeah, they're never going to argue with you. So yeah, you've got a captive audience. It's very interesting that they really think of these as true relationships. He found a friend. Right. It's very interesting. Wow. Yeah. Because cannibalism is often a sexual-based crime, there's often a typical escalation pattern that we would see with a lot of other predators. Cannibals usually begin by fantasizing about necrophilia or voyeurism, and then they start watching people sleep, and then possibly drugging people or assaulting someone who's unconscious before that last step where they actually seek out human flesh. It's so bizarre that it is considered a sexual crime because to me, normal, relatively normal person, eating a person has nothing to do with, you know, sexuality or any of that, but it's just, it's the motivation behind it. And these are obviously people that are maybe a little tinfoil hatty, not exactly with us, right? I just can't understand getting off. When there's any sort of, you know, just necrophilia, all these things they fantasize. I I mean, I don't think I'm supposed to understand. Right. Sorry. I keep trying. That's what separates you from a cannibal. (laughs) Thank God. And a, quote, tinfoil hatty person, as you you just called it. Well, you know what I mean. I'm never going to forget that. I'm going to use that commonly from now on. No one can see us, right? (laughs) Right. Right? But they know what I'm saying right now. A person with a tinfoil hat, like, you're, you're fucking crazy. Right. It is interesting to me that they do follow this typical escalation pattern, but it's so subtly different because with cannibals, it often involves 
someone not being conscious. That well, seems how to do be you the- escalate cannibalism? <laughs> I'm thinking of it. I'm like, wait, wait. So you no, but- start by... No, but you know what I mean. They follow yeah, this pattern of, you know, maybe being a peeping Tom, yes. maybe, you know, being a little bit creepy around someone at a sleepover and just watching them, right. that kind of behavior. Oh, so it yeah. doesn't really come out of nowhere. They don't usually just- They're eccentric. Go to zero to 90, but they are. Yeah. They're weird. And they're probably the type of person that you dismiss and you like wake up and they're staring at you and you're just like, oh, that was weird. I would bet they're also a person who tends to want to blend into the walls in a room maybe a little bit. They don't really want to be seen. Maybe they don't want to be observed. And like inside they're craving attention and love and affection from other people, but they just can't. They can't explain it or they can't say it or they're not allowed to in their head or something. And so it's easier to just blend in and mm-hmm. be a boring person. And then who just, is a cannibal? Right. So I don't know. I just found it really crazy that there's this very specific escalation pattern. Well, I know? like this breakdown, this little informational yeah. cannibal piece because it's true. It's usually it's like the cannibalism is secondary to the murder or something. But with this, it's like. Yeah, it's just crazy. And I always remember like the Gilligan's Island episode Mm -hmm. with the natives. Every time we talk about cannibal, that is what pops in my head. And I think that was, like I said earlier, I think in modern day times, we use cannibalism as this kind of judgment of like, oh, that's what these people do over here. On the island. Right. Mm -hmm. It's crazy that the modern portrayals of cannibalism involve so much racism. Even looking back at 80s television shows and looking like my jaw just drops like, really? Oh my God, I know. This kind of racism, homophobia, it's just crazy. Problematic is a great term. So yeah, we know that those kind of modern portrayals are more that. But really, the ones that are true cannibals are more of what we're going to talk about today, which is Gregory Scott Hale. So that's, you know, this is the typical one, not the outlier, not the, you know, inaccurate portrayal of cannibalism. So 37-year-old Gregory Scott Hale lived with his parents on Pete Sane Road in Manchester and worked at a slaughterhouse in Tennessee. I looked into this. It's about an hour southeast of Nashville. I'm so bad with geography. Thank you. No, I am too. That's why I need to see (laughs) where the hell this is. He had a girlfriend and a teenage son named after a Norse god, which we both kind of looked into it. And I think this person's a minor, so we don't know the name, but his it name's really, Odin, right? Like, like you know, you it. know, you know this kind of person, right? Yes. We all know the person that's obsessed with Norse gods. Yes. Yeah. Gregory didn't really fit into a small town, as you can imagine. He kind of looked to me like a Hesher, right? Yeah, the Hesher community in Nashville's time had come and gone, I believe. Yes, someone that's just yeah still has this typical look, well beyond. The uh, popularity of, let's say, corn. You know? Yeah. No, I'm just trying to think. I'm like, what the hell is this guy listening to? Lots of life is peachy. Yeah. yeah it's definitely this time. <laughs> A lot of ICP. Oh, man. Man, that's an episode in itself. We got <laughs> Juggalo go murders. Yeah, juggalo murders. <laughs> Ooh, I'm fired up now. He was known by those in his community as a Satanist and a devil worshiper. And from what I understand, he was pretty outspoken about these things. I almost want to say that it, there was a Damien Eccles element of shock value, but I think there was some belief in what he was saying. No, he was loud and proud. The difference is Damien Eccles was a 16-year-old kid who was shock value. This guy's like a 37-year-old He's man grown. trying to tell people, yeah, I'm a demon worshiper, this and that. I feel like it's different. He had reached a point in maturity where he was pretty committed to Satanism, it seems like. Yeah, a bit. You know? Most people in the neighborhood recall feeling pretty uneasy around Gregory. He was not one of those people where the neighbors were shocked and said, he was such a nice guy, you know? You (laughs) see all those like, oh, I can't believe that happened. This was not the case with Gregory. All the interviews, people were like, Yeah, we kind of expected something was coming. Yeah. Which is, again, kind of uncommon. Some of his selfies online depict him with weapons, including a large steel machete or cradling snakes. You know this guy, right? Like, Is he 
you know, we all have like the family we have to be friends with, right? Right. You see this on their feed. This is like your cousin. Yeah. You're just like, ooh, what? Okay, what is that picture? You and know? what am I? Am I supposed to call them when I see that and be like, hey, how's everything going? Because <laughs> I don't know what the fuck that was at 4.36 a.m. that you just posted. But right. um, I'm concerned. How's your snake? I feel like a bitch. But then what if something happens to that one? I always say, like, check your family, check your neighbors. You know, the killer's coming. We know this guy. Like, everybody knows this guy. Everybody listening right now knows him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, you know, 99.9% of the time, this guy isn't a dangerous guy. No one takes this guy seriously. Yeah. It's easily dismissible. In several photos, you can see Gregory carrying long-bladed knives and weapons. Sometimes he's wearing masks, like slipknot masks, basically. And there's several posts and pictures that are about Slayer. Of course they are. (laughs) Just always this guy loves Slayer. And there's a lot of pictures with him, just his arms folded, scowling. Some with those um, like white contacts, you know, just that kind of stuff. I would feel bad describing so much of his physical stuff, but we do that to women all the time, so oh, fuck it. This dude it. gets a physical description. Bring it. You know what else? I know what this guy does. It's about equality. I think it's like Thursday nights. I know what he's doing. He's watching that show Forged in Fire about <laughs> making the swords, and then they're like, we're going to cut through the side of beef, and we're going to cut through a steel sh- you know, conduit, wire, like all this shit. That's what this guy's doing. <laughs> I know what he's watching. That's funny. You're totally right. And listening to Slayer. He's probably got Slayer playing while he watches it. He's that guy. (laughs) So although, of course, plenty of this is not a problem, we know (laughs) these people, you know, Gregory is, again, the exception to everything. And it just may describe this, you know, a random person we know, a true crime addict, a general metalhead. But Gregory took it a step further. You know, although none of this stuff in and of itself is concerning. It's important to point that out. He was the one outlier that definitely there's cause for concern. Just a little bit. In addition to all this stuff that's just, you know, easily explainable, his Facebook page is filled with disturbing, sexually explicit, grisly images, as well as references to cannibalism and Scandinavian mythology. You think he's ever been out of Tennessee to travel to Oslo? Or something, right? Yep. Fucking everyone knows this guy. He seems kind of like the type of person that talked about disturbing and taboo things just for shock value, especially in his little Tennessee town. Um, He seemed like he wanted to be an outsider. You know, that was part of his identity was being different and alternative. He was rejected in high school by the popular kids probably one time. And he was like, okay, fine. You aren't going to be cool with me. Then I'm going to be so on the fringe. I'm going to be that guy. Yeah. And then you can't hang out with me. Yeah, exactly. And then I'm in control. Flip the script. I did it. (laughs) One of his favorite subjects was Richard Ramirez, who he he idolized. It was definitely kind of an obsession for him. He allegedly read Ramirez's manifesto really obsessively to the point where he wanted to follow in his footsteps. A post after Richard Ramirez's death read, quote, R.I.P. Night Stalker, wish I could have met you. That's like what people post about their grandparents that passed away before they were born. Wish I could have met you, Pop Pop. I mean, he was a very real part of his life. He was attached to him. Yeah. So bizarre, because that was like 1988, 9, you know? Interesting thing to latch on to. Yeah. But people, but he's a cannibal. People are really obsessed with Richard, you know? Richard's got fans. Hardcore And fans. fan fiction and yeah. a lot of creepy shit. You know what doesn't help is that he, he doesn't look completely unattractive in those mug shots. <laughs> That's a nice way Even to Even the that. ones where he's got his hand up and he's got the pentagram, you're like... I could clean that guy up. You're just like, he has great bone structure. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, it's, that's a fact. That's an yeah. absolute fact. He really does. Another thing that Gregory shared on Facebook was this post that basically posed the question, would a vegetarian taste like fake soy meat if you ate them? I think maybe like Beyond Burger. Beyond Burger is good as Beyond fuck, Beyond Burger is amazing. They have the sausages <laughs> and the meat and the crumbles. 
<laughs> I think we're biased because we both uh, have significant others that are vegan. Mm-hmm. So we get the best vegan food, right? We do get really good vegan food. But then yeah. there's also times where it's not good vegan food. Oh, no. <laughs> but Beyond Burger, stamp of approval from Courtney. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just, I don't know. Like I do think, though, the texture of them is weird. And I could see, like, I don't know. I can go with this one and be like, yeah, that, sure. That's what a vegan tastes like. <laughs> I like that joke a lot. I just. Uh, that's a great one. He just irritates the shit out of me, you know? Yeah, that's just a stupid thing to put out there just so that someone will ask you a question because you need attention. Right. That's what that is, right? I feel like he knows that it's causing concern. And yeah. He's, but he's able to semi express himself like I am really interested in cannibalism. Can I, I'm going to post it as a joke kind of thing. Like check out this funny thing about how vegetarians taste like vegetarian meat, you know? Absolutely. And that's just, I don't know, irritating to me at minimum, but also just creepy, you know? He also posted an image with a caption. I hug the people I hate. So I know how big to dig their hole in my backyard. That is an inspirational quote from You can something. see that with like a beach background. Yes. Footprints in the sand. Right. <laughs> and I hug the people I hate. But it's just, I don't know. That's just shock value shit. It too. really is shock value until he murders someone. And yeah, it's like, yeah, oh, okay. this was based in something real. <laughs> yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> but it is an interesting thought. As soon as I read that, I was like, it's kind of brilliant. If you're like an extreme, if all you are is a killer, right? And you're like, really think, well, where am I going to put this person? I got to make plans. You're a planner. You're OCD killer. Yeah, hug him. Because you might need an extra foot. That's something you think on your inside voice. You know, this is an inner monologue thing. And he just doesn't have an inner monologue. He has no difference between kitchen table talk and Facebook posts. I find his shock value shit really obnoxious. It's really like hack to me. It's very hack. It's a cry for help, I feel like. That's what I think, too. He wants someone to step in and be like, hey, stop talking about cannibalism. Don't eat anybody, you know? And does he think that there's just like some woman perusing Facebook who's going to see this and be like, this is a guy that we have similar interests. Well, that's the thing that we often think of. He has a girlfriend, like I mentioned before. So this this fool talking about this stuff with these colored contacts and machetes has a girlfriend. I forget that. I completely forgot that entirely. (laughs) Because I'm just like, what's the motivation? It has to be pussy, right? Because it's nothing else that makes sense. He's just motivated by like, I just want people to notice me. Even outside of more close relationships, it seems like he's very needy, like we talked about. He fits that personality type. Oh my God, you're right. It's the low self-esteem that's overcompensating by, you know, that kind of childhood instinct of any attention is good attention. Even if I get bad grades... I'm still getting attention. You nailed it. And he just keeps moving forward into his, well into his adulthood, 37, living with his parents, trying to get attention with these stupid Facebook posts and loud music. I just immediately think of those poor parents in their golden years, right? Trying to just enjoy it. Here comes Greg moving back in. Mm. Although he may have fantasized, planned, and possibly even stalked women, Gregory actually had no criminal record, which I found really surprising. This doesn't surprise me because to me, it's like I wouldn't expect someone who is so about cannibalism to the point where they act on it. You know, you you probably keep your side of the street clean because you have such insane thoughts. It does make sense to me that he would be really secretive in practice of these things. You know what I mean? Even though he's talking about it for attention. Exactly. When he actually does things, it's going to be very, very sneaky. Yeah. But at the same time, it's really common to see people caught for, you know, walking around the neighborhood, looking in windows and stuff. I am actually a little surprised that nobody caught him. It's probably part of why no one takes him seriously. Because someone, if you're a gang member with no criminal record, it's like, how great of a gang member are you? Right? Right. How great of a cannibal is How Greg much of a Satanist are you if you're not getting in trouble for, like, stealing someone's dog and sacrificing it? Right. So... I don't know. Maybe it just everybody thought it was empty threats or whatnot because he had no record. Gregory had moved in with his parents after actually being fired from that meat processing plant after the owner caught him performing satanic rituals. That's like too convenient. There's just too many things to say like, oh, cannibal organ meat processing plant. 
It's yeah. Talk about, you know, I'm into fishing. So I work at Bass Pro Shops for my discount. I mean, really and stuff like that. Right? I'm into cannibalism. So I'm into just taking apart meat. Like <sighs> that's crazy that he worked there. He wanted to learn to do it right. Right. The owner of the slaughterhouse explained that Gregory would also take home blood, animal bones, and eyeballs with him. This, do you think that this is what's getting him through and keeping him from murdering? That's the thing. I think that the fantasy of a person has to be a person. It may yeah. have held him over for a minute, but I don't think that that period of time would be too long because hmm. that's not... That's not the fantasy. I, you know, I was reading, um, I don't even remember the article, but I was kind of looking into it about how your sexual fantasies are developed from an early, early, like crazy early Whoa. age. And so the things that you attach to that you sexualize, even if you're not thinking about it as sex at the time, if you all of a sudden look at like feet, then feet are going to be sexy forever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and you develop that at an age that's really small. So this stuff with human bodies and cannibalism had to have been something that he saw or saw a dead body in the yeah. woods as a kid, like stand by me or something, right? When you're little and then it just, it's, it's an obsession and mm -hmm. then it becomes sexualized. So that's the thing is I don't think that the animals could have held him over because we know that these are really not changeable like once you have that in your head that you sexualize something that's not typically sexual you know totally then that's it for you you know that makes perfect sense very good very well done <laughs> brianna very well done so i don't know i just i no, think you know <laughs> very well done but i agree that there is this kind of thought that maybe taking apart the animals would yeah hold them over a little, a little bit but ultimately, there was really no way of yeah. avoiding this without a crazy amount of therapy to just be like, hey, these are my urges. I need to stop them. Help me you work know? through this. Yeah. And how do you, I, you know, it's funny because I've thought of this before. You're the therapist and someone comes to you and says some crazy shit. For example, I have these feelings that I, I would like to be a cannibal. Are you trained for that? Right. What? How do you train for the cannibal that comes into your psychologist's office? I it's mean, it's crazy. so amazing sometimes, but that's why this guy is underground. You really can't share those real thoughts no. with anyone. You can no. joke about them on Facebook. You can say things for shock value, but you can't really be honest about it. You can feel it out too, like what other people think about how far you're taking it, or you know, you can feel it out with these memes or whatever the hell he's. You it know. may be exciting to him to yeah. joke about it or whatnot. Or even to just work at the slaughterhouse and be around these, you know, bloody things. I would and think that that's a lot of it is the environment of the blood and the guts. But eventually, that can only hold you over for so long. The actual attachment and sexual sexualization is attached to a human. Ew. So there was no way for the slaughterhouse to last forever, basically. <laughs> When he was fired, he started drinking more and just being kind of a deadbeat. You know, he moved in with his parents, became by all accounts a pretty gnarly alcoholic, you know? Yeah. While getting beer at a liquor store in June 2014, he met a woman named Lisa Marie Hyder. Lisa was a sweet and outgoing 36-year-old. She had six children and two ex-husbands. It's a lot of baggage. It is. And a lot of kids. Yeah. It's just a lot. Lisa is this person that definitely had some struggles, yeah. you know? She'd recently also, on top of all that, been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And from what her loved ones say, she was actually choosing to not get treatment. That's a pretty wild decision. Yeah. I mean, she was just in these end days and had come to acceptance, which is, I can't even imagine no. where she was at emotionally. That's why you would drink. Right. Just mm -hmm. knowing that, you know, she had all these children and she wasn't going to see them grow up. I mean, it's got to be devastating. It's terrible. Lisa was an alcoholic and the cancer diagnosis really had only made the drinking worse as you could imagine. Her family members describe her as somewhat of a lost soul who had a bit of a troubled past. 
They say that although Lisa had been a bit adrift in recent years, they'd always held out this hope that she would turn her life around, you know, and it seems like that was kind of dissipating now that she had the cancer diagnosis and she was leaning into the alcohol. She had suffered from an addiction to alcohol her entire life, which led to these two marriages that failed and left her very estranged from all her family members. It was a huge rift between her and the rest of the family. It's exhausting. Yeah. When you have alcoholism that badly that, you know, your marriages are failing. You got kids just left and right with, you know, different people. And now you've got six, two total. Like, that's a lot of kids. Even if you're married, like, that's just a lot. I mean... Yeah. yeah, you drink. It would be overwhelming even if she was involved in their lives. I think you know? I meant when I said you drink, it's overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. Lisa and Charles Hyder were married for six years before separating in 2013. So a year before she met Gregory. But Charles Hyder said no matter what she'd ever done, he always loved her and supported her. It seems like he was borderline codependent, but really he was holding out hope that someday things would turn around. A lot of it was probably for the kids. You know, he had this idea of maybe someday we can be a happy family, just not right now. Yeah. He was often there for her whenever she needed help. And he seemed to struggle, like I said, with a little bit of codependency, which kept him from setting some healthy boundaries. So he was often the one coming to her rescue. When she had a problem, she went to him. Even though their marriage had ended, he'd held out this hope that she would stop drinking and they could get back together. So every time he helped her out, he was kind of hoping this would be the last time and she'd get better. That's sad. Yeah. But of course, one of the hurdles that was in the way of her quitting drinking was the fact that she actually worked in a liquor store. Terrible. I I know. Hey, at least she's working. And I can understand she probably sought that out because it would be the easiest, you know, job for her to keep. Employee discount. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Hair of the dog every day. So you can make it to work when you work at a liquor store and you're an alcoholic. Right. This is not a problem, but it's the decision and it's everything behind it. It really sends a message to me that she was leaning into that alcoholism. I just, I hear when I read about struggle, Mm -hmm. struggling. She's just struggling and she's still kind of making it. She's got her job. If she loses that job, we're we're in trouble. But right now she's struggling. She's kind of making it through and everyone still has hope for her. Yeah. So she hasn't completely lost it because there's still the little hope. At around 2.30 p.m. on June 8th, 2014, Lisa called her ex-husband Charles asking him to pick her up from work, but he said that he was in another town working and he asked her to just wait for him. He was basically, from what I understand, unloading a truck or something like that, so it would have been a little bit late. She would have had to wait a little bit, but just if she did, he would come pick her up. When he was finished working, he started heading towards Lisa's work and he called her several times, but she didn't answer. And eventually, when he couldn't get a hold of her, he just decided to head home. He figured she just got a ride and he'd go back to the kids. Lisa's other ex-husband also received a call from her and she left him a voicemail asking him to come pick her up. But it seemed like he was a little bit less proactive. He figured she already got a ride. The same same thing. Yeah. When Charles tried to call her back again, she didn't pick up. So even when he got home, he wasn't able to get a hold of her. For the rest of the weekend, he was still trying to get a hold of Lisa so she could talk to the kids because she pretty much checked in with them every day, but he still couldn't reach her throughout the entire weekend. Says a lot about her too, by the way, that every single day she checks in with her kids. Yeah. Because there are a lot of parents, just divorced parents even, that they don't call their kids for months at a time and they can live a block away. Even without the struggles that she's having with the alcoholism and the cancer, it seemed like this wasn't something... I know that people have the tendency to say nice things once someone's passed away, but it seemed like she really did check in with her kids. She wanted to be a good mom. It just wasn't possible for her. It sounds like she had a problem. 
Yeah. She had an addiction to alcohol. And like that is really like the the crux of the problems here. If she could quit drinking, she could probably put her life back together. But unfortunately, she can't quit drinking right now. Right. For whatever reason that is. And so she works at a liquor store. That doesn't help. What her ex-husband didn't know is that she had met Gregory Scott Hale that day and he was the one that offered her a ride. Gregory had stopped by the liquor store that Lisa worked at to get beer on his way home and he noticed her standing outside. And Lisa had just gotten off work and she was just trying to coordinate a ride just outside the liquor store on her phone. So Gregory chatted her up and he offered her a lift. Since they'd just met that day, Lisa was hesitant to accept his offer. But ultimately, she was kind of tired of waiting. She really didn't have anyone confirming that they were coming to pick her up. And she had no idea when someone would be able to give her a ride. So she just agreed to go with him instead of waiting for an indefinite period of time. So he started driving, but instead of following the directions to her place... Gregory began driving to his parents' house. And this is one of those horror story moments that stands out for me. This is one of my worst nightmares, to be in a car and be telling someone, okay, it's a left here, it's a right here, and they're going in an opposite direction that you're telling them. Yeah, That's just terrifying, the Mm -hmm. kind of buildup that you know something bad is going to happen. So, of course, Lisa became a bit worried and she voiced her concerns and Gregory reassured her that they just needed to make a quick stop at his house. He's like, "Okay, I hear you. I get it. There's nothing bad going on here. I just I was on my way home and I got to go there real quick, you know. So when they got to his house, she said she just wait in the car while he ran inside real quick. But he told her that he was going to be a minute. So she just should come in and have a quick drink. No, we get out and we start walking somewhere. We start making a lot of noise and you don't stop. I mean, and you know what? This is really awful too because when you're like, you know, you work at, let's say you work in retail. You just work at a store. You have regulars that come in all the time. You work at a liquor store. You work at a grocery store. Regulars come in all the time. They seem like nice people. All you really know is like their card clears. They're cool. They say please and thank you. And then one day you need a ride and you see this guy who's like always cool as fuck. You know, he's nice. He's got kids, whatever. Sure, I'll get in the car with you. Don't do it. If you do it, hold their identification in your hand and then jump out of the car when they don't take you to the right place. (laughs) I am so distrusting of people, but it's stuff like this. Yeah. This is why you can't just take rides from people, even if you know them. This is what scares people about Uber, too. Yeah, it's just, I don't know, he knew what her weaknesses were, and that's what makes it sad, is he knew that she was in a vulnerable position because she needed a ride. She was also in a vulnerable position because, you know, maybe she had already been drinking, so he could see that she would probably say yes to a drink. It was just really like this perfect storm where he knew exactly how to play into those vulnerabilities. Manipulative piece of shit, too. Exactly. Playing on, like, her just, oh, it's terrible. So since, of course, we know Lisa's weakness was alcohol, she was definitely eager to have a drink, and she agreed to go inside with him. Once they were inside the house, Gregory lit a fire, and he poured Lisa a drink. They sat by the fire, and they talked for a while, and according to Gregory, eventually they got familiar enough with each other and drunk enough that they actually began kissing. This is, again according to Gregory. Yeah, always. He suggested that they go into the bedroom, so Lisa went along with him. And they had sex, and Lisa fell asleep in his bed. Again, I can't state enough, this is according to Gregory. So for me, there's a little bit of concern about consent. I don't really know if maybe she had said no, maybe if this was rape. I don't know if she was even fully conscious. Maybe she had drunk enough to, you know, pass out or something, especially knowing his cannibalism and that's the escalation. He's, I mean, his story is that she fell asleep in his bed. I take that as she passed out because she probably was drunk as fuck, you know? And I mean, it's not completely unheard of to like meet someone, have a drink, fuck, fall asleep. 
I go home and everything's fine. It happens. If it wasn't Gregory Scott Hale, exactly. if it wasn't a cannibal, I'd be like, okay, cool. I mean, people go home with each other. You're an adult. You can fuck who you want to fuck. There it is. It's not, you know, on me to decide that. However, just because it's coming from him and, you know, like we discussed the escalation pattern, there may have been an element of non-consent or unconsciousness or whatever. Yeah, Lisa isn't here to tell us about it. Exactly. And that's my point mm-hmm. is just we don't know what she would say about it, you know. So it's important to point that out that he claims, you know, he nabbed this girl that she just wanted to fuck him. And we don't know if that's true. She would probably say he had a tiny dick. Right. <laughs> And I also read other accounts that while they were sitting around the fire, Gregory attacked her. But I I just don't know. I think there's a point of fogginess here where we don't really know what happened. Yeah, it's his word versus no one else's. Yeah, so it's important to point that out. What we do know is that there was a crime scene in the bedroom. And it seems that while she was asleep, Gregory went to get a machete and then came back and he swung it down on her while she was sleeping. She woke up and screamed while he was swinging the machete several times more and blood spattered all over his bedroom walls and it was on the mattress and the carpet. Gregory took pictures and then began dismembering her body. He cut off her hands and put them in a bucket with her head. He then cut off her feet and put them in a separate bucket. He continued to take her corpse apart and then cooked and ate pieces of Lisa Marie Hyder's body. He then took her torso out to the yard and placed it in this burn pile where he planned to eventually bury it, but he just left it out there above ground. I mean, what the fuck? It's There's blood everywhere it's really a nightmare scene i'm just a tragic thing to happen to her is he gonna have his mom clean it up because that's the other thing i mean i know you there's no way to be like what was this person thinking when they did that but what the fuck was he thinking when he did that you live with your parents in their house mom will barely let you light a candle because it's a fire hazard why are you cutting people up in a bedroom like she's not gonna be pissed you're gonna stay in the wood floor I can't even imagine, like you said, what he was imagining this would go down as, you know? Five gallon buckets of people everywhere. Yeah. Living in a house with other people that are definitely going to ask questions because they're your parents. And a parent parent never stops being a parent. So you know that someone's going to be like, what the fuck happened to this mattress? You know? I can't... I feel like he went into this knowing that he wasn't going to get out of this. Does that make sense? No, completely. That's kind of what I think, too, is, well, we're going here now, so let's go all the way. Because I'm not coming back from it. That's what kind of seems to be my thoughts on it. Like, it's worth it to me for all the trouble, the prison time, if I get caught. He might be thinking he's so smart he's not going to get caught. It's going to be worth it to me for my mom to yell at me. To kill this person and get my kicks. Maybe he thinks it's just going to be this one time and he'll be over this. Like it's done once he does it once. Maybe. But that's generally not how this works. But, you know. Yeah. I just think that there must have been an element of acceptance of consequences going into it. Like. It has to be. Either I know I'm going to get caught and at least I was able to act out this fantasy is to me the one scenario or the other one is. Maybe he thought his parents would just cover it up and help out. I don't know. Like, maybe he thought his parents were so attached and codependent and whatever that they would be like, okay, well, this happened in our house. But or maybe he thought he could clean it up enough to where they were just like, well, something questionable happened, but I don't know what it is. He's basically banking on the fact that he's got the same parents as that affluenza kid <laughs> whose mom like helps him, dyes his hair, and they flee to Mexico to help him fight a charge. Okay, I'm telling you right now, I don't know those parents. They aren't mine. Right. <laughs> They'd be like, this little bitch in this room, she fucked up the wallpaper. That was custom. Yeah. No, this isn't happening. Honestly, that's... It seems to be the only two options. Yeah. You know, either he accepted being caught or he thought that his parents would be affluenza parents. Maybe they covered, you know, up for him or something. But he had no criminal record again. So it's kind of like it's it's very out of character aside from the fact that he's proclaiming. But this is the first like physical act of crazy except for bringing home animal parts. But 
this is really, you know, different. It's a big leap, but I'm just wondering, like, what he thought was going to happen, you know? It and just... he'll never tell anyone the right. truth, so it's not like we could even write him a letter. I feel like the, gr- the so only you know. thing Gregory wants us to know is that... He likes Slayer. He he got this girl to come home with him. Yeah. You yeah, know? Yeah, he's a stud. Honestly, I think that's all You're he wants so us to right. know. Is just like, yeah, this girl wanted to fuck me, you know? She came on to me. Yeah. He's never going to be fully honest about what he was thinking. Him and his tiny dick. <laughs> so the thing that's really crazy to me that makes me say possibly he thought his parents were going to help is the way he got caught was that he went to a neighbor and asked if he could borrow some tools and get some help disposing of Lisa's body. And that's where I make that leap where I'm like, maybe he did think he had affluenza parents, you know? Affluenza neighbors too. Right. I mean, he he just thought people would be okay with this or something. And of course, the neighbor called the police and said he thinks someone needs to come over and investigate Gregory's house. Oh my God. (laughs) I'm telling you right now, if this asshole that lives upstairs from me comes down here and is like, hey, uh, you got a skill saw? You got some impact drivers I could borrow? I'm asking uh, questions. Yeah, I want to know. I I mean, he's already doing construction all day anyway. We all have those experiences where like something weird is going on. Can you imagine your neighbor coming to you and being like, hey, this is what's up? And he's already that satanic guy. He's already the weirdo, which he's cultivated that reputation himself. Right. So he's fine with it. It's not like people call him those names and he doesn't know. He's fine with this. Everybody already has their suspicions. So so. I bet those cops, you know, they floored it. They knew that house. Shit, we got to get there. So when officers arrived at the scene, they discovered a burned torso in the yard, body parts and buckets, and her heart had been thrown into the neighbor's yard. Do you just lob that like a softball over the side? Like just whoop. It's a weird over detail. Over a shed? What? We don't know if it's specifically the neighbor who he asked for the tools from. We don't know which neighbor it is. There's a little bit of mystery there. But I, I it seems strange that he would so haphazardly throw this heart. And it's another thing that makes me feel like, yeah, he was in acceptance of this was him acting out his fantasy. He's ready to go to jail. I mean, the other thing is I just have to assume that he's drunk out of his mind. Mm. Like, th- I just have to think that. But at the same time, it's I mean, what the fuck? Yeah. He's just got buckets and burned people. And there's just like this, you know, person is just out there. And not denying nothing. Just, you know, this is what I'm doing this afternoon. Yeah. When the detectives, you know, started interrogating him, He basically laid it out that he'd fulfilled this lifelong obsession. This is what he always wanted to do. And he just wanted to dismember this person. And he'd done it. It was that simple when he talked to detectives. Psychiatrist and serial killer expert Dr. Park Dietz believes that Gregory confessed because he wanted to be remembered as a notorious criminal. Which really does play into this, you know, idea that we talked about of his constant attention seeking. Dr. Dietz says, quote, many serial killers admit to comparing their body count to other serial killers and reading books on serial killers. Like anyone else, they have curiosity about people like them. They don't want to feel alone. They want to feel special, but not be the only one. So interesting. He just wanted attention. Mm-hmm. Like that's what it comes attention down to. and connection. It seems like yeah. connection to other people like him, connection to the person he's eating. It's a very weird thing that happens in the brain that the cannibal really feels like this is their relationship. This is their equivalent of having a boyfriend, a girlfriend. And I would imagine in the in Nashville, like Tennessee community, there's probably. I mean, I, I don't know if there's a huge like satanic community over there. Right. But he probably does feel more alone. Even with his Facebook pages and all this shit, probably does feel really alone. So like, yeah, he's looking for the connection. This isn't the way to go about it. But again, that's Gregory's style. (laughs) Going about it in the wrong way. It's Greg's style. It's Yeah, definitely. It's like the way you wear your hair when you're surfing. It's Greg's style. (laughs) 
Dr. Stephen Egger, associate professor of criminology at the University of Houston, said that if Hale hadn't been caught after his first murder, he probably would have gone on to murder other people. He says killers are motivated by power, dominance, and having control over somebody else. They like to play God. Gregory Hill was not a skilled practice killer, and I think he was just getting started. So I I do believe that there's some element of him thinking that he would get away with it. And if he was caught, he would have been okay with that too. Like he was just an acceptance, like I got to do this. No, I, I definitely think that if he had gotten away with having five gallon buckets of Lisa in his yard and nobody seemed to notice and his parents didn't say shit about the blood and if he'd gotten away with it, he was definitely, this was happening again. Yeah. And it's like he said, you know, yeah, I did it once and and now it's done and it's over. Take me away. But if he hadn't gotten caught, he would have done it again. He liked it too much the first time. Right. He said it. It satisfied that shit he'd always had. So like, it's like any good drug. I want a new drug. Yeah. He was (laughs) really getting started. Yeah. At this point. So Gregory was charged with first degree murder plus abuse of a corpse. And he was held on one point five million dollars bond. Lisa Marie Hyder's family said that they planned to push for the death penalty. I think this is a this is a death penalty case. I think it qualifies. And that's just, you know, Courtney talking out loud. But but yeah, definitely being from their family, I can understand the brutality that happened to her. They would be justified in wanting to get the worst, harshest penalty. And it could have really been any girl standing at the liquor store. Yeah. That's what's really sad. And that's why I keep like, don't take rides. Yeah. Even if you think he's nice. It's just, it's really sad that we live in this world that we have to constantly have our guard up. And just Lisa was in this place where she was just like, I can't be that person to have my guard up. I'm too vulnerable. She needed too much. You know what I mean? Like she was in the perfect position to be victimized. And it's so devastating that she was there that day. We had an episode prior, I believe it was Altamont. We talked about your dad and his good, clean fun. Right. Right. Okay. So back in the day, good, clean fun, hitchhiking. Right. And it was totally fine. Never right now. I mean, I will take some leaps in my life and do some shit. I'm a horrible, impulsive decision maker. I would not hitchhike right now. No. I don't know a lot of people who really would. Because it's just a scary, it's just too scary. It could be Gregory Scott Hale. However, I will get an Uber. Right. You know, of things, all the risky behavior, it's, interesting, it's it? just hitchhiking to me equals murder 100% right? of the time. But you're right. I remember being with my dad when I was, I don't know, like six or seven, and he picked up someone hitchhiking. No. Where are we going? <laughs> and really, I mean, I don't know. My dad's just a good guy. There was a woman on the side of the road, and he was just like, Are you okay? At least like, stop and see if she's okay. Yeah. Clearly something was wrong. And he was like, where do you need to go? I need to get you home because you're something's wrong. And there's a little bit of a blank spot where I don't remember what happened. But just the idea that back then someone would have just picked up another person while their kid's in the car. Are you sure your dad isn't a killer? Because having a six-year-old in the car with him to pick up a woman hitchhiker who's just stranded, happens to be in trouble, a distressed woman, right? You got your kid in the car, so of course you're going to trust him. And then you suddenly just said aloud that you don't really remember. Like, maybe it's blocked out. You have some amnesia. Dissociate a little bit there. What the fuck is that good, clean fun your dad's talking about? I know. We talked about it recently, and I think something like the woman was a little bit like, you know, had some untreated mental health stuff going on. Yeah. And I that's where the blank spot happens, where he says something <laughs> weird happened. Got and it. like he was, he had to like ask her to get out of the car. Sure. You know, like... I don't remember a murder. <laughs> See, ma'am, I got this six-year-old in the back seat, and you're freaking her out, yeah. right? Like, get out of the fucking car. Thought I was doing something nice. Yeah. Good, clean, fun. He was, not anymore. He was really trying to help, and it was clear that, you know, it was not a safe position for me to be in, basically. You know? Amazing. <laughs> but yeah, it was much more common, Yeah, you know? And, but it is interesting that this is 2014, that yeah. this crime happened, you know, and maybe they are, I don't know, they're not really that much older, you know, no. they're, they're both in their 30s. So they didn't come from the hitchhiking generation. No, I mean, they're, you got to <laughs> joke, haha. They're as logical as you and I, right? 
Mm-hmm. You would imagine. They but know. But there's just a lot of red flags and there's a lot of booze going on here. Yeah. There's a lot of um, altered consciousness thinking. Right. And I, it's something that you have to factor in that Absolutely there was, have you know, this diminished capacity, you know. It's so sad. So, of course, since the family was definitely seeking the death penalty, they decided to do a plea deal. It never really went to full trial. So as part of the plea deal to avoid the death penalty, he pled guilty to first-degree murder. Her ex-husband, Charles Hyder, that we talked about before, that was really hoping that she would get better, he was just devastated, and he blamed himself Oh, my God. You know? I can't even imagine. Yeah. I just put my hand to my chest like, poor Charles. I know. I mean, if he had just been there to pick her up. Right. He says Shit. that he really regrets that he was in another town working that day, that he wasn't local. And he wished that he'd just been able to drop everything and get to her faster so she would never have taken that ride from Gregory. It's so sad. He blames himself so much. Charles explains that he usually is that one that rescues her every time something goes wrong. And he is just heartbroken that he couldn't save her from Gregory. And he says that the children are too young to really understand what happened to Lisa. So he just told them that their mother got sick and she's gone to live with God. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, wow. And again, just she has six children. I mean. And I don't remember the specific ages of every child, but I know her youngest one was only a couple years old at the time. Very young. I mean, yeah, you know, you don't tell the three and four year old your mother was hacked to death like this, right? But at some point, you got to go to them and go, hey, I lied to you. And I guess because she had cancer, you can say, well, she had cancer. She died sick. She got sick. She died, right? She didn't take treatment, but... I wonder, because there's six kids, so there's the potential that at least one's got an attitude. There's one of them that's going to be very upset. Yeah. Minimum one for not being told the truth about their mom. Yeah, it's definitely a tough situation. Well, what that do you do? Their, their fathers yeah. are in because they are really too young to process all the information. And it's so sad that she was already sick. They were probably already starting to introduce the concept to them that yeah, she right. was sick. And then they're wrestling with that emotionally, and then all of a sudden she disappeared and she's yeah. gone. I, I can't imagine the Maybe kind I'm of- Maybe I'm being harsh. I think I'm just, it's just the whole thing is so sad. Yeah. And she's got six kids. What do you do? What her husbands went, her ex-husbands went through and the children is just one of the most devastating things. I can't even imagine trying to go to your child and have that conversation on top of processing the grief of losing her. I think it either it's either going to bring you together or it's going to drive you apart. And it's pretty recent and I don't really have any updates on the children. You know, I try and follow up and say what's going on with them and hopefully they've Most gotten Most of them are minors, it. so we probably couldn't even really find anything Right, but to begin they're with. very small still. Yeah. Unlike her ex-husband and children... Her father, Billy Poor, says that he'll never forgive Gregory Scott Hale. Billy said, quote, My daughter was mangled, butchered, and chopped up like a liver. There's nothing left. He also explains that his other children are really struggling to cope with their sister's death, and one of his daughters is even plagued by terrible nightmares since the murder. Lisa's father goes on to advise that parents really need to wake up and be more involved in their children's lives so they know exactly what they're involved in. That's really sad that the father is saying that about his adult daughter. Yeah. Because theoretically, your parents aren't really supposed to know about your grown up life at a certain point. Yeah, they're just supposed to, you know, know that you're yeah. an adult and independent and you're doing well and whatnot. But he just has so much regret that he didn't really know the kind of danger that she was in by being so deeply entrenched in her alcoholism. Yeah. But at the same time, you really can't. It's a delicate balance. You can't go over the line and be super codependent because then it's affecting both of your well-beings. And if he was to go to her and go, listen, Lisa Marie, you're drinking way too much. She probably would not take that for the love and support that he's trying to give. 
I really don't know what the efforts were to help her overcome her alcohol addiction, but it is one of those ideal cases for an intervention, you know, to say, we love you and we want you to get better. We want you to have a relationship with us and your six kids and we want to offer you treatment, you know? She had two super supportive ex-husbands too, which is kind of unheard of. Right. So yeah, they were, people were around, but it's not like Lisa's alcoholism is the reason, you know, I mean, this guy was going to fucking kill someone right it's just you know it's impossible for her ex-husbands and her father to not question what it would have been like yeah if she had gotten help you absolutely know? and how she wouldn't have been in that situation so it's like any you know survivors they're just questioning what they could have done and it's so heartbreaking that you know to process this is so difficult for them yeah. you know i can't even imagine so that's the story of Gregory Scott Hale and Lisa Marie Hyder. Cannibals Part 3. So and just like bikers, I'm ready to move on to something I'm else. I'm so glad it's over. Because I, yeah, I can't. These stories are just so tragic. Yeah, they really are. And like this one really, it really upsets me that he just exploited her addiction. Because that, I have a whole nother level of angry about it. Uh, it's one thing to, you know, manipulate this, you know, situations, people, this and that. But she had a serious problem and he may have known he may probably didn't, you know, but I have a feeling that he knew exactly what he was doing. And when he turned left instead of right, she should have jumped out of the car. And it's easy to say, but yeah, I mean, I don't want to like venture into the territory of a victim blaming you know because there's just nothing the person at fault here is Gregory like, no he found her but the fact that he at minimum could walk in and be like this woman works at a liquor store she wants to party you exactly. know like at minimum it was just that instinct of like oh she's a cool chick she's gonna want to have a drink with me totally think that's how at it started very minimum but then knowing that he's got these urges yeah. from an early age that he can't really quell without actually acting on them. You know, he goes into it knowing that this would be the kind of vulnerable person that he could victimize. And that's she just could have so been sad. Any drunk chick outside of a liquor store. Right. And that's the sad thing to me is it's just like, she just happened to be there. And it's really devastating that I feel like her alcoholism made it impossible for her to stand up and say, I'm tucking and rolling out of this no, car. No, she needed a drink. You know, I think that maybe yeah. it, it really diminished her ability to weigh that logic out of and course. get out of the situation. And, you know, maybe someone that wasn't already drinking or someone that didn't need this ride or whatnot would have been able to just be like, fuck it. You know? Yeah, there were a lot of circumstances. She needs a ride. She's probably already been drinking. And her addiction is that strong that she will get in a car with a stranger with the promise of a drink Yeah, and a ride home. It's just the predator and the prey. And some people are just really good at picking out prey. And it's the same thing we saw with like Leonardo, for example, just yes. making this perfect profile of the person that you could victimize. And oftentimes this doesn't happen by chance. This is someone preying on a specific community of people or a specific type of person yeah. that they know in their head they could, you know, kind of not get away with it, but they're more likely to go along. Or there will be enough time before that they can get away with whatever they need to get away with yeah nobody's gonna come looking for them for a while they're a lost cause they're a lost soul oh she's just a this he's just a that so as much as i think that gregory scott hale is just a, a fucking idiot yeah. and a creep he did you know like any murderer think a lot of this out Mm -hmm. And I think that this didn't just happen in a vacuum, that he knew going into it, one day I'm going to find a woman outside a bar or at a liquor store, or whatever, we'll just have a drink. It'll go too far and I'm going to do what I want to do, yeah. you know? So, oh, man, I'm I'm so ready to not talk about cannibals anymore. <laughs> yeah. Machete to the back. Ugh. Yeah. Letter C is definitely over in my mind. Good. So we're moving forward with our alphabet next week and we'll be on letter D. I'm super excited. Yeah. <laughs> 
The letter I D. Always, when I start off the new letters, I'm just like, yay, it's something new. It's fun. That's it's why exciting. I, I love the format of going through the alphabet because we can learn about like the intricacies yeah. of cannibalism or whatever. And then next week, it's something different. Yeah. I, I really like doing that. Learning Something else we're going to do. True crime of. stuff, right? Yeah. And then by the time I'm done and I just can't eat because we've talked about cannibalism right? and I've lost 10 pounds, then we're ready for a new letter. So I've just never looked at a person and thought, you look yummy. I mean, in a, in a way to eat your body. I don't know. It's so weird to make that leap to where a human being that you're having a conversation with around the fire and having a drink is actual food to you is food you know what I mean yeah. like that's how I look at vegetables and you know like yeah. that's how I look at bread like what <laughs> you see those cartoons of you know roadrunner in yes. the middle of the desert and you're looking at this Turns woman like turkey. that you know yeah no it's completely foreign to me but like we said it's just something that in childhood yeah. you saw a body at the wrong time and then that's what you got to do and I eat meat right. I make bacon a pound at a time so I don't have to do it later you know it's like <laughs> I eat meat and I just and that's the thing is I do too but I also have this instinct in my brain that's just like oh this was a living being yeah. so if I think that like I wouldn't be willing to actually kill something that I'm eating you know what I mean? Like, I don't think that I could do that. Mm -hmm. I don't think I could slaughter something. However, like, now you've got to take that one step further, knowing that you just, you know, killed this living being. Now you're killing a human. Yeah. And eating it. Oh, it's just such a huge leap for me. It really is. Huge leap. Too much. Too much. So, again, we're done. Cannibalism is over. We're moving to letter D next week. So we wanted to remind you before we get going to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Also, if you have a chance, we would love to get more five-star reviews and hear some positive feedback from you guys. We always appreciate it. Just like any other podcaster, we do this every week and it's something we put out there that's a lot of work and energy and time. And um, it really is great to hear positive feedback from people. It really is. I so, like knowing that people like what we're doing. Yeah. And especially just indie podcasts, you know, yeah. it's really great to just say something nice yeah. so people know that their work, you know, doesn't go unnoticed. Not just us, like, you know. No, yeah. Always rate and review everybody. Yeah. Any podcast you listen to. I try and be really good about that. I When do I too. listen to shows and I'm like, you know, I know you work hard on this. I want to say that I appreciate it. I know that sometimes on my iPhone with iTunes, I'll go submit review and it doesn't go through. And I know. I and know it's so about. frustrating that iTunes is so glitchy. I know. I've read on Reddit a lot of people very angry about that as well. So I thought it was just me doing something wrong. But I guess that there's a lot of times on iTunes, if you try to leave a review on your phone, it won't go through. Just yeah. FYI, folks. It's glitchy. But hopefully, you know, I know that all podcasters appreciate it when they oh, absolutely. get some positive feedback. So... Like we said before, we have a Threadless and a Patreon. So if you want to get some merch on Threadless or join our Patreon, those links are going to be in the show notes. And we've got a few people to say thank you to. Again, Brenda, Dan, and Ashley that are new on our Patreon this week. So thanks, you guys. Thank you. So I think that's pretty much it. We can get going and start working on letter D for next week. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. See ya. Bye. Hi, I'm Brianna. And I'm Courtney. From Crime Screen Podcast. Where every week we talk about movies, TV shows, and docuseries based on true crimes. We discuss all the bingeable and unforgettable true crime that we're all watching on our screens at home. Like Making a Murderer, Mommy Dead and Dearest, or Dear Zachary. So if you're like us and have the problem of scaring off people at parties with serial killer facts and true crime stories, or you just try to talk about whatever you watched and get horrified looks from coworkers and even hear exasperated significant other, then we are your new friends to discuss all the true crime with. Follow Crime Screen Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to stay updated. And subscribe to Crime Screen on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever else you listen to podcasts.
Good call on McDonald's for lunch. Yeah, let's eat. Okay, we have the oh yeah for me. Can you hand me my mmm mmm? Yep, and here are a couple of woot woots to share. I love my woohoo! Oh, sounds like Stacy went to McDonald's too. For a limited time, grab a hot and spicy McChicken and small fries for just three dollars at McDonald's. Price and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with combo meal. And now, a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to Geico. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance.